Oh, the yeah. wine is made in the field. Is what <laughs> <laughs> that was the right answer. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much. Cheers. 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 Nice one. Very nice. I'm Leslie Russell. I'm the general manager of St. Helena Winery. Tom Rinaldi. I'm consulting winemaker for Pellet Estate. I'm Eric Titus. I'm the owner and vineyard manager for Titus Vineyards. My name is Dave Ewell, and I'm the owner of a Vineyard. Um, called, we call it Ewell Vineyards, my name and I'm also past president of the Appalachian St. Helena. There's about 45 wineries and there are about 20 uh, grape growers, vineyards. Well, a grape grower is a vineyard uh, owner and manager uh, and winemakers are the people who get the grapes and convert them into wine. We like to take the credit for it, but it's really the yeast that are doing the work. But, uh, <laughs> We, we'll, we'll let it go with that. <laughs> well, AVA is a recognized um, grape growing region within Napa Valley, and it is uh, geographically separated from each other. And there are uh, unifying factors based on either elevation, soil type, uh, proximity, uh, or um, uh, defined by a, a a drainage area, you know, up and down the Napa River. So, and uh, ultimately there are distinct uh, characteristics that come from those growing regions. And so then the members within the AVAs are those who grow grapes and or make wine from the fruit uh, within those regions. Technically it stands for American Viticultural Area. And they're across the country and um, they're very well defined. Um, so if you have your AVA on, on the wine, if it says St. Helena, it has to be at least 85% from that region. Quite often it's much closer to 100%, but uh, it, it, they're usually very well defined from one region to the next. See, the Appalachian was founded in... 1995. We submitted to the TTB. It took a couple of years. Uh, I wasn't here in the valley at the time, so I don't know all the deep history. Eric might. Um, and uh, then we formed the Appalachian St. Helena Group, reformed it basically in uh, 2005. So the Appalachian St. Helena is the modern name for what was the St. Helena Viticultural Club, which was founded in 1875. So one of the cool things about this Appalachian is the historic you know, nature of it. This is where winemaking was founded. This is where the early vintners were collaborating and getting together to create higher standards for grape growing and winemaking to you know, kind of pursue excellence. And that collaborative nature that still exists today in Napa Valley it was born back then with vintners like Charles Krug and and Henry Pellet and George Belden Crane and David Fulton etc and I'm talking like you know the 1860s <laughs> We're a very small winery. We make about 1,200 cases of wine from our state here. Um, when I say a state, I mean that uh, to have that on the label, it has to be 100% grown, produced, aged, bottled on the estate, so you have 100% control over it from vine to bottle. And we make Cabernet Sauvignon, um, and we are uh, our, our consulting winemaker is Aaron Pott, and our, we have a young woman winemaker named Lindsay Wallingford. We have a really small team of you know, six people here that uh, grow the fruit and make the wine, and, and we have a little bit of distribution around the country, but mostly it's direct to our private clients here. I supposedly retired uh, in November of uh, 2014 from my day-to-day -day winemaking activities, and so I'm a, a winemaking consultant, uh, typically making the final blends, uh, picking decisions, uh, coming up with uh, with with wines, uh, much more so than uh, than doing. A, well, I do marketing. Uh, I don't mind that a bit, but uh, primarily I'm a production guy um, overseeing the winemaking. Don't have our own facility now, so it's a custom crush um, operation.
So we are family owned and operated. Um, the property that we farm, uh, 50 acres, has been the family uh, since the late 60s. So as of last year, we celebrated our 50th year of, of farming here in Napa Valley. Um, of those 50 years, uh, we've been making wine under the Titus label for um, a little over 25 years. And um, the uh, uh, area is right on the Napa River, so kind of as far as the San Lina Appalachian, uh, a lot of it is really defined by location up and down the Napa River um, as this property, uh, San Lina Winery, backs right up to the Napa River on the west side of the river. We are on the east side of the river, about a half mile up river from here, from this location, and most of our property backs up to the river there. Uh, we're primarily a Cabernet producer, uh, but we also have Zinfandel that was planted back in the mid-70s. Uh, we're, we still have that program and um, Cabernet Franc and several other varietals, a little bit of Sauvignon Blanc as well. So everything that we do comes off of the 50 acres. Um, we are, we don't estate grow because when I say everything, we do supplement, um, none of our programs are based from uh, offsite fruit, but we do supplement from other vineyards, neighbors. And so uh, just to be on the safe side, we, we don't label estate, but um, again, the lion's share of what we do comes off of our own property. Well, Tom rode his bike over here in five minutes, and Eric could <laughs> have, but he drove. <laughs> 22 years. Okay, that's new. Gosh, you're That's real new. It's, right it's newer than him. <laughs> <laughs> I have done that, not currently doing that. Um, but once you move to the valley, you, you, you get in, there's only two businesses here, wine and wine-related and hospitality. So you get into one or the other, and uh, my wife and I came up here and really loved this property, and, and even better, we had a great built-in customer for the grapes. And that has worked out to be a wonderful, close relationship, and they buy all that we grow every year. Two acres. Okay. Two acres of Cabernet. Originally, I'm from Boston, but uh, I didn't get that. No, no. Uh, but we spent 33 years in Los Altos, down near Palo Alto, south of San Francisco. I am from over the hill in Sonoma originally, but as, yeah. Ooh. But as I said, my family um, has had a presence here for uh, 50 years. So my folks bought the property in 1969 when I was in grade school, and so we, we were living over in Sonoma at the time. So I spent plenty of time over here as well. And so of all the you know college degrees, advanced degrees I have, when I moved back to Santa Lena, the most valuable degree I had was my Santa Lena High School Absolutely. diploma. <laughs> I'm born and raised San Francisco, um, way back in uh, 49, so I'm a, officially a San Francisco 49er. <laughs> and um, I uh, went in the military. I signed up at when I was 17. And uh, the rest is history, if you will, because I got the GI Bill and that was, got me to college to do whatever I wanted to do. And it turned out to be uh, malting and brewing and winemaking and uh, came out to the Napa Valley, I like to say in 76, but then they go, is that AD or BC? So I have to say uh, 1976 is my first vintage in Napa Valley. Um, well, I was born in Ohio, my family's from Ohio, but I was raised in Northern California, near in a little cow town south of Sacramento. Where in Ohio? Uh, my dad's from Middletown, and okay. my mom's from Cleveland, and then my husband's from Merrill, Wisconsin. It's easy, for one, um, and I think this wine that we have in the glass here from this particular state, which is, again, right down the river from us, um, Valley Floor, um, I think you get a, a soft tannin. Um, we're on the Valley Floor. St. Helena is one of the warmer parts of the valley. It gets a little warmer as you go farther north, but we are certainly have a high degree day um, that our fruit maturity is exposed to and that drives the fruit, fruit maturity. So you're going to get a, um, a high degree of concentration and fruit forwardness, soft tannin. And I, th I think that our wines um, do express that. And you really, if you line up the varietals, you really see a common thread. Of course, a certain amount has to do with the winemaking, but the winemaking really ties back to the raw material. And so I think that that is how I define the St. Lean Appalachian, is in the, you know, both the structure, soft brown tannin, and then the, the concentration, the body of the wine, and then generally the fruit forwardness, if that's the style that the winemaker is, is aiming for. But again, that style is really dictated by, you know, the quality of the fruit that comes to that winemaker. 
I work in really close partnership with my customer and the team that manages the vineyard. And between the three of us, I mean, I listen to those two talk back and forth and they figure out what they want and what to do in the vineyard, but it's the collaboration between the three parties that turns out the, the great product that I think tastes delicious and I'm really happy because what we make, the customer loves and we make it as a team. No. <laughs> I have a couple of business degrees and I've always been in sales and marketing and I've been in working in the wine industry since I got out of college in 1992 was my first job. With I worked for a Gallo distributor, worked for St. Supri for 18 years, always in sales and marketing. So when I became the general manager, um, now I'm all of a sudden in charge of vineyards and winemaking too, ultimately responsible to our owners for that stuff. So uh, like Dave says, uh, you know, it's, it's about listening to the people you work with are on your team. We have consultants. We have great staff with a wide variety of experience. Listening to them, learning from them, and and trying to make the best decision for the long term. This is every decision here is long term. It takes wine several years to go from the you know from the vine to the bottle uh, to the just you know to the out of the warehouse <laughs> and uh, when you plan make planning decisions like we're doing a replant right now and trying to make the right decision for the next 20 25 years it's not easy <laughs> you hope you have a good team and you and we do and one great thing about Appalachian St. Helena and these groups of vintners and growers is that we can talk to each other I can call up these guys or any of my uh, any of the members in the organization and ask them what their experience is because we have a similar climate similar similar terroir generally valley floor and uh, I lean on them a lot well, as a grower I never know what disease is just around the corner. What kind of pests, what kind of disease, and, and you just gotta be observant and, and have a great vineyard manager who is aware and up on this. We've had, in, in the 20 years we've been growing, we've had several different pests or diseases come through, and uh, fortunately it hasn't hit us too hard. Uh, but it's the thing you worry about as a farmer. For me, uh, the crazy part is a good crazy. Uh, you don't make the same wine twice, not in this area. Um, so we're trying to get a thread of familiarity, it's a great term, uh, that we have as our signature, but we certainly don't have the same vintage twice in a row or out of 45 that I've had experience with, uh, I've never seen the same one twice. So it's, uh, that's the fascinating, crazy part of the deal. Um, it isn't at all like beer making, where you're making the same thing every day, year round. Um, this is a seasonal uh, phenomenon, and uh, we, we take full advantage of all the positive aspects and try to disguise anything that might not be positive. Well, there's a perception that the wine business, um, as we have um, uh, created locally here in Napa Valley, um, is one of leisure and um, that we sit around and do this all day. Yeah. Yeah. Which is exactly what he's doing right yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I'm done here, I'm going to go and walk through the vineyards and just look at things. <laughs> and, then, yeah, and then maybe go back to my office and watch the wine sell itself. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so there's a perception, and I think we've done a very good job on making that perception because that's what draws people here. But it is a lot of hard work. And it, before anything else, it is a business. And on the grape growing side, the production side, the sales, um, it all has to make financial sense. And sometimes that's difficult. One of the frustrating things about, about the wine industry for me is the regulatory environment and how different it is for every state and the fact that we can't ship wine directly to our, our fans that live in certain states. Um, things like that. <laughs> It's alcohol. We have puritanical roots here in the United States, and I understand where that comes from. And I appreciate the Constitution that gives the states the rights to make their own decisions about the distribution of alcohol. But it's a little frustrating <laughs> when you're trying to, you know, appease and explain to you know, a consumer. One thing I hear about from winemakers is that there's consistency and sunshine on an annual basis. You can rely on 
a lot of sunshine. We're in this particular part of the valley where we're not we're far enough from the fog belt that kind of impacts the lower the southern part of the Napa Valley. We're a little bit farther from the the coastal influence that comes in through Knights Valley. So we get a lot of sunshine. I live in Napa and I drive up Valley every morning throughout the year and it's foggy where I live and I pop out into the sun around, you know, sometimes Rutherford, sometimes it's cloudy here too. We get foggy mornings too, but generally more sunshine. For me, the magic is the uniqueness of this very specialized area. Um, we're, we're blessed with cool nights and that's crucial. Uh, you get the complex sugars that form cocoa and coconut and flavors. Uh, we don't put lemon lime in there, no, but we'll we'll have that characteristic show up in the wines, and it's it's the magic of the of the atmosphere and the temperatures and the the drainage of the soils and uh, the magic of the sun. Uh, we we're very blessed in in Napa Valley. And in particular, as we start to get to the particular AVAs, they all have their own signature. And uh, I just love to be able to describe somebody what, you know, would make just the perfect combination to me, you know, say a, a, a grill and uh, a particular slab of meat and uh, this, this wine in five more years or something to that effect. So you can get very specialized, but you don't have to be a snob about it. You could just say, this is really what I enjoy to do. Well, I think it is val three validations that it, the wine's made in the vineyard. I mean, it's, it's the soil and the climate and, the, and what we produce. You can't make great wine out of bad, bad grapes ever. And I think that goes back to that we, we don't know how blessed we are until we leave this area. And <laughs> uh, I mean, I grew up in the area and Sonoma Valley, Napa Valley. And I thought I knew what the four seasons were all about till I moved back east and um, realized that uh, there's cold in the winter, there's humidity, there's rain all summer long. And in a lot of those grape growing, those regions of, uh, around the country, people are trying to grow grapes and it's very difficult. And we have a very predictable rain season. We have a pretty predictable, uh, predictable uh, temperature regime throughout the summer. We know within days when we're going to be harvesting from year to year. And maybe every 10th year we'll have a challenge, early rains, something like that. Uh, whereas I think some of these uh, other grape growing regions, that's uh, more the norm uh, yeah. that they're dealing with. You know, mildew pressure all summer long, rain, mud, um, hail. Uh, and it's just very difficult to, to even grow a serviceable crop, much less make a really good wine out of it. So um, if you are from this area, you do have to leave the air to realize um, how difficult it can be elsewhere. And uh, as, as Tom was saying, it's the easiest growing region, I think, anywhere nationally, and it produces the best grapes. I mean, it's one thing it was easy grape growing and produces lousy <laughs> grapes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would just be so. <laughs>